Hello everyone, welcome to our session on Big O. So today we will learn about the concept of Big O and it is kind of basic as we begin into our coding. If you already know this, you can absolutely skip this lecture and move on to the coding problems and we will talk about different kind of data structures. And if you do not know about this, then please stick to this because this is one of the most asked questions in all of your interviews. And your interviewer will ask you to code something and then definitely ask you about Bego. So let's begin. Basically, Bego is the most common measure of an algorithm and it helps us uh, calculate the performance of the code that we put in. So every interview wants you to write the most efficient code there can be and once you check its performance using this big o algorithm and it is important to know because it is basically a measure of growth and we can calculate both like time and space complexities using our big o algorithm so we will first they are mostly similar we will first begin with our time complexity and for this um let me show you an example so we have a function here which basically prints all the numbers from an array and we have a for loop in here so suppose we get an array which may have a length of suppose n and then we print one function so this is just a single line print this will be o of one because it doesn't take any kind of time in doing this the most important thing are the for loops while calculating the performance of the card so as you can see it runs from it is for i in range length of array, which means it will run from basically 0 to the length of array, 0 to n minus 1. And here it will be like printing two things, which both of will be like O of 1 each, and they will combine to become O of 2. And since it's printing like every n times, this whole for loop, as I mentioned here, this will be like, this will be run n times. Again, the last one in the statement it will also take O of 1. Now, if you want to calculate the whole complexity of this algorithm, it will basically be this O of 1, then O of n into 2 because two statements are run for every n and the last O of 1. So, what you can do is you can combine this and this, which will make it O of 2 plus O of 2 cross n, and this will become O of 2 plus 2n. Now, this is one of the basics, but you also need to remember that this 2 and this 2 they are constants, they can be replaced with c, and we can ignore c whenever calculating our big old time complexity. So, this will become O of n because we are ignoring our 2 during addition as well as multiplication. So, this will become O of n. I went through the whole process of calculating this algorithm, but what you need to do is just understand the for loops and basically. Uh, the number of times the loop runs depending on the input n. So it runs from 1 to n, that makes its time complexity of it. That's the nested loop to calculate the time complexity of it. So here we have our program uh, that prints like enter, this will again be O of 1 and so on. Like this and this O of 1 and both of these also O of 1. But like the important thing is that this loop, this for loop that is inside, this will run till the till the length of the array so here we have multi-dimensional array like this and the first loop will run for each row and the second loop will run for each column right so here for the second one for the second loop the loop that is inside this will run based on the number of columns so suppose we have n columns this inside loop will run for o of n and the outer loop this one this is for the number of rows. This will run. Suppose we have n rows. This will run for O of n. And therefore, each time, like each of this inside for loop will run n times multiplied by n times for each row. So thus the complexity will be n cross n. And this is one of the most important and basic complexity that is used, like O of n square. Alright, and let's see 
some of the common complexities i'll just talk about some of the common complexities that we see in a lot of programs they could be like oh. they could be o of one o of n as we talked about o of n square o of log n basically log n is when you divide by like reduce or increase the number by by two that's like the most common but there are the variants as well in this o of 2n this is exponential and yeah there can be o of n log n and we will continue to talk about these complexities as we do our algorithm codings in the future sessions moving on we will talk about worst case complexity like we always care about the worst case complexity we do not care about the average or the best case complexity i will show you an example to illustrate this so here we have a program that is trying to find a target in an array so we have our for loop basically running from zero to n and then whenever we see that our target matches that particular index in the array we return to otherwise return false so suppose we have an array like one two three four five six seven and you're given the target three so this loop will run like one two three you find the target it returns two and that's it so like your time complexity would be o of three but in the worst case your time complexity could like your target could be seven the time complexity could go from one to seven which will make it o of n or in any case you might not find your target you have to return false in that case also your time complexity will be o of n you always care about the worst case because you do not know what our target could be all right moving on let's talk about space complexity space complexity is basically knowing about is basically similar to time complexity and we consider the amount of memory that is used suppose um, the memory use does not depend on the size of the input then that is like constant space so suppose you use a variable a and assign it the value of one so it does not depend on our input that will be like space complexity of one but if it depends on the size of input so suppose you're given size of n and then you create a new array of that particular size n then its space complexity will be o of n let me show you a quick example to illustrate this so suppose here we are trying to reverse an array and we are given the input array suppose it is like one two three four and so we use this result this result will be a new array and we will make it so like zero four times so we have already allocated the space equal to our input this will make it a space complexity of o of n and then we use the for i loop which will basically put all the values of array i starting from the, this will be returned so our space complexity here will be o of n as you can see it dependent on the input and if we had a variable and input this would be o of 1 so that's it for now we will continue to discuss big O and the performance of each and every algorithm that we see in our future sessions so that you get a good idea of how to explain it to your interview. So today we will learn about arrays which are one of the most basic and the most simple type of data structure. Arrays are basically a collection of items that are stored in a continuous manner. So you can store different items in different data blocks that are arranged side by side in a continuous manner. And these can be of any data type, these can be string, character, or integer. For simplicity, let's take them as integer as an example. So they can be like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on. And I can name all of these elements into one variable. Suppose I name this as an array, ARR. So the most basic advantage of using arrays are that they allow random access. So I can randomly access any element in this array because of the indices I will know. So Array start with zero index and then it keeps on increasing. So what I'm writing at the bottom, these are the indices of these numbers. So I can call any number in this array using the their indices. Suppose I want to call the number four, I will use the index three and this would be equal to four. Sorry about that. All right. And the other advantage of using an array is that they can represent multiple data types, multiple data types using one name as already shown. Arrays are generally of the same fixed size as given here 
but some languages like Java and Python provide resizable arrays. So you can just simply use append function in Python and append the number eight at the end. And this, like adding an element, will take O of n time. The reason is that you will have traverse the whole array and then only you can add at the end. Even if you want to add an element in the middle, you will have to shift all the elements to its right one right and then only you can add which will also take O of n time. So this is addition and O as I already said the traversal will take off n times but getting an element just because oh, you know it's in this will only take O of one time. So these are the basics of array. Let's move on and see how reverse traversal in an array work. So reverse traversal is basically traversing an array in the reverse direction. So basically you start from the end, the last end is. For this you need to know the length of an array. Suppose this variable is ARR and my length of array is length of array in Python. And I need the end is one because we start from zero end is. So this will be my last end is length of array minus one. I can point a variable to this and then keep on reducing my variable by one and this will allow me to reverse traverse this array. Now there are different advantages. We can solve problems in a different manner whenever we are traversing in a reverse order. And for this, I will show you an example. So we have, I will show you a question. So let's take this question as an example. This is an intermediate level question. So we have to replace each even number in an array with two of the same number as shown in the example here. We have one, two, five, six, eight, and then we will replace all the even numbers like two, six, and eight with a couple of those numbers, basically one, two, two, five, six, six, eight, eight, eight. And you can assume that you have uh, enough space. So suppose the input is one, not one, just one, two, five, six, eight. It is one, two, six, five, eight, and then three minus ones at the end. So you have to replace each even number with two of the same number. Be careful that we only have to replace the even number. You can pause this video, go ahead and try it by yourself. So the basic idea is, as I already said, is reverse traversal. So we will point our pointers at the end of the array. And suppose I have the last pointer here. And I also have another pointer i here. Now I will bring this i till the start of the numbers, till like there's no minus one. So as soon as I bring i here, I will check if my i is an even number. If it is, then I will put the value of i, which is eight at the last pointer and reduce my last pointer. And then I won't be reducing my i pointer. I will again put the value of i into my last pointer again. I won't check this time for the even condition. Now again, I will check for six, the even condition. It is true. I will bring it to this pointer. I will take my last pointer here. Then this time I won't check. I will just exchange. Then I will come here five. This will be false because this number is not even. So I will simply put it once. My if condition will be false. I will put it once here and then reduce my last as well as my I pointer. So here when it comes to two, I will so on. I will do it. And this is how we will reverse traverse. So here is the code. And as you can see, we will first check for the base condition if the array is zero, its length is zero, we will just return that null array. Then we will point this to the last pointer, right? And i as well to the last, last in this. And then we will run this while loop so that we bring our i as I shown earlier, one, two, five, so let's take example, one, two, five, six, eight, minus one, minus one, and minus one. It's clear now, yeah. And then we will reduce i till i come to eight, and my right pointer will be at the end. And then I will keep on checking this while loop until i is greater than zero. And here I'm checking two things. First, in the if condition, I'm checking if it is even. I, if I, it is even, I will replace my right with the value at i and then reduce my right by one. And then I won't check and then again keep on reducing it. And then finally, I will get my answer. And the important thing here is time complexity, which will be O of n because we are using this while loop. So this loop runs from like n times. That's why this is the major thing. The time complexity for this will be O of n. All right. I will be giving you a couple of questions and I recommend you solve them before moving on to the solutions.
Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Hello everyone. So let's talk about the linked list data structure today. Linked lists are basically a chain of nodes. So suppose this block that I have is one node and there can be many nodes. And when they're chained and linked together through a pointer, this is the pointer they are known as a linked list. So each node can hold a value. Suppose they can hold a value of integers like one, two, five, six. This is a node holding a value. And then this is the pointer which points to the next node. So we usually call this pointer as next. And we also have, we usually get the value of the node using the val keyword. So these two important keywords, next and val, in these in this series of nodes known as the linked list. So in the linked list, when you're searching for an item, you will basically start from this, the first node, which is usually called the head, and then move on and traverse to the linked list till you reach that item. So suppose you wanted to you wanted to find an item with the value five, you will traverse this linked list using the next pointer until you get this five. And this traversal or searching an item will take O of n time. And if you want to add or delete a node, suppose you want to add a node at the end and you have a pointer to this pointer six and you want to add another node. So you can simply have a node pointing to seven using the next keyword. And this will take of one. So adding, and even if you want to delete, suppose you have a pointer pointing to five and you want to delete six. So you can simply, instead of pointing from five, you will cancel this out. You don't need to basically cancel. What you will do is you will make fives next directly point to seven, basically point fives next to six next. And then this part will come out of the linked list. So you will be remaining with one, two, five, and seven. So O1 for delete as well. All right, let's talk about um, the code that we usually use for like, basically we have a class as shown here. And what this basically represents is the value and the next, this is the constructor class that we create for every list node so that we can have a value assigned as zero and the next assigned as none by default. This is what we use in functions usually. All right, moving on, let's, let's talk about the traversal. So as I showed you in the previous, previously, we traverse the linked list and the code for traversal would be something like this. So we basically have a function traverse. We have a pointer head pointing to the first node and until there is head, like until we do not reach the end of linked list, not because the end of the linked list would be none. So until we don't reach it, this loop will continue and we will keep on printing its value. So suppose we have one, two, and then none. So we'll print its value one, and then we will point our head to the next, to the next of it. So now our head will come to two, we'll print its value, and then our head will come to none. And this while loop will come out and our one and two will be printed. This is how we travel. So it's very simple. Moving on, let's talk about append function. So as I already showed you, we have to, we can append at the end. We just need to know the node and the head. So we basically start from the head. We keep on pointing, we keep on increasing our head to the next pointer, to the next node until we do not reach the none or the end of the linked list. And then we introduce like head of head dot next equal to node. So suppose we have these two nodes and then as soon as we reach here, okay, this should be why head dot next. Yeah, so as soon as we reach here, as soon as we have we are at the last node, we can point it to a new node. This is how we append. This will also like, this will, uh, this function will take off end time because we are traversing, we have not provided from the previous node, but if you were provided with the previous node, then it will take O of one time. But this one, because we are traversing, this will take O of end time. Moving on, let's talk about delete. So suppose uh, you are given the head as well as the previous one that you want to delete from. So suppose you have a link list. You want to delete this one. And this is your brief. This is your head. 
So basically you will check if uh, the node that you want to delete it is there or not. And then you will see if the that particular node is head, then you will simply make head equal to head dot next. Basically you will make this as head and then return. This will be pretty simple. But in that in case that your head is not the node, you will simply make previous dot next equal to node dot next. So directly like this and then return the head function. So if you know the previous um, and you know the head, this will take off one time as well because you're not traversing anything here. All right. Thank you for watching and see you in the next session. Hey guys, welcome back. So let's talk a little bit more about linked list. Um, as I already told you that we have a next pointer in linked list pointing to the next node and that's how you can traverse a linked list. But in some cases, we also have a previous pointer. So suppose this is a node and we will have a previous pointer pointing to its previous node. So this linked list, what we have right here is a doubly linked list. Basically it has next pointer as well as the previous pointer. So this is known as a doubly linked list. There are list questions based on these, but it's important to know this concept. Also, uh, let's talk about uh, fast and slow pointers. So uh, while solving some questions, what you can use or what you can do is suppose you have a simple single link list and in order to solve a question, you want to have two pointers pointing at the head name one as fast and one is slow and then you will move your fast pointer a couple of times in one iteration and slow pointer only one times so like every time slow moves one fast will move a couple of times so like while the fast is here slow will be here and then the slow will come here the fast will be here and while the slow will come here like slow won't be able to come here because fast will be at the end of the linked list so we will use this concept in one question and I'll show you that question. So basically, suppose you have a linked list and you have to find if it has a cycle or not. So it could be something like um, this. So this linked list has a cycle and this one does not have. These can be any numbers, one, two, three, and so on. One, two, and three. So you have to find uh, if the linked list, given linked list has a cycle or not. So what we'll do is we will have one will be fast and one will be slow. So we will move fast a couple of times with each iteration and slow one time. So when fast is here, slow will be here. And in the next one, fast will come back here, slow will be here. And in the next one, slow and fast both will be here. So if the slow and fast uh, match, then that means that the linked list has a cycle. If they do not match, then it means that they do not have a cycle. And if there is a cycle in this linked list and fast is moving a cup at the twice the speed of slow, it is obvious and it is mandatory that they will meet once in at least two rounds of the cycle. So the maximum your linked list could go is two rounds, not more than that. And we also have a code for this. So let me show you the code. Yeah, so here is the code and as you can see we have pointed slow and fast to the head and while fast and fast of next means that fast has not reached the end. We have fast of next because fast is moving two times here, like next dot next and slow is moving just one times and if at any point of time, if they become equal, then we have to return to that means it has a cycle and if not, we come off the loop and it is false. So this is a little bit about slow and fast pointer. I will be providing a few questions based on this and uh, linked list as well. Try to solve those questions and I will be providing the solution. Please let me know if you have any questions about that and see you next time. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's learn about stacks today. Stacks are very useful in few questions and they basically use this leaf for implementation, which is last in first out. So you can assume this bucket to be kind of a stack. What we do is we can push an item and pop an item or we can also peek an item so suppose you have this list of numbers one two three four five and you can start pushing an item so 
when you push one, you have one at the top, and then you can push two, then you can push three, then you can push four, then you can push five. The important thing here is that once uh, you have pushed items into the stack, you can only access the topmost item because you do not have access from the bottom. So that's why it's last in, first out. So whatever is last in, that is five year, it will be the first out when you pop. So one of the functionalities that I just did was push. And when you pop, so you basically pop is taking out the last element, taking out the topmost element. So you can remove like five from here and four pop and then three will be popped and then two will be popped and then one will be popped. And if the stack is empty and you want to, you try to, you know, pop another element that is known as stack underflow. And if the stack is full, suppose you are given a size and it is full and you try to, you know, push an element that is known as overflow. And uh, in Python, you can use linked list or an array to make a stack. Basically, all you need to do is you need to restrict addition and remove from one side. So suppose you have an array, you will only be allowed to access the last element, basically append at the end or pop from the end or just see from the end. So suppose, uh, let me show you the basic functionality that you can use in Python. So suppose you have, a, you created a, an array named stack. So how you can create a stack. And then if you want to like push an element, the function that you will use is append, which will basically append the number at the end which is basically push in our stack so suppose you want to append the number two then a stack will contain two and similarly you can do more numbers and if you want to pop an element the functionality that arrays provide is stack dot pop so whenever you use pop it will pop the last element two will come out and if suppose you have uh, like you Append again, append another number again. Suppose you append one, and then if you want to peek, you want to just see what's the topmost element, you will use stack uh, basically access the last most element in the array, and this will give one. So, this is how you can use an array in Python to implement stack. You can also link list, you can also use link list basically addition at the end and access or removal at the end. You won't access from the start. That's how you can implement stack. Thank you. And in the next one, we will talk about a few questions related to stack. Hey guys, welcome back. So we will look at a question related to stack here. And this is a very basic question about stack traversal. And I will provide a couple of other questions as well as a solution that as an exercise that you can solve at home. So let's look at this one. You have to find if a given number n exists in stack and the main thing is restore the stack at the end so suppose you are given a stack which has numbers like five three two seven and one at the end at the beginning and at the end i want this stack as it is like you have to restore at the end and you have to find a given number three if it exists in the stack or not so what we can do is we can keep on popping as soon as we reach the number three, we can return true, but that does not solve this condition restoring the stack. So a way of doing this would be we have a temporary stack. And what we'll do is we will pop each element from this S, the original stack and push it into the temp. But before pushing, we'll check if it is equal to n. If it is equal to n, then we'll break out. But if it is not, we will continue and we will basically push it into the stack. So one popped, not into the stack, then seven popped and it is not equal to n, we'll push it. Then two popped, it is not equal to n, then push it. And then we will pop three, which is equal to n. So we will hold like we can uh, have a status of found that will be turned to true to be returned. But now we have to return it, uh, restore our stack. So what we'll do is till the time your temp is empty, we'll pop from temp and keep on pushing into our original stack. Guys. So now pop two, push it here, pop seven, push it here, 
pop one push it here and also like we didn't pop three i'm sorry we will pop like afterwards and we popped every element from here so our stack is as it is and our status is returned to let's look at the code here so this is the code that we have <sighs> so the end number is given the stack is given we have a status found equal to false a temporary stack and till the time stack is there we will keep on popping and storing it into variable top now as soon as your top is equal to two we will change found to two and break it. so see that we did not pop the stack we are only peeping peeking at the first and checking and if it is true we'll break so we won't come to this line if it is true but if it is false we'll come to this line and we'll append it to temporary and as soon as you found it or even in case you did not found it you will be returning found it then either true or false and in both the cases you will have this loop running so while there is some number in temp you will pop from temp and append it into the stack basically push it into the stack that's how our original original one stack will be restored and we'll also get to know if uh, the number is present in the stack or not watching and do try to solve the questions that i'll be giving but if not i will also provide the solutions with them see you in the next one hey guys welcome to our session on queues so let's learn about this data structure queues are very important and they are basically a linear data structure that uses fifo implementation so fifo is first in first out so whatever goes in first will come out the first basically suppose uh, you have this list and there are a couple of restrictions so the first restriction is that you can only append at the end not at the beginning just at the end that's your first restriction the other restriction is that you can only take out an element from the beginning so whatever goes suppose you have an empty queue you want to add an element you add an element at the end this is the first in now you add another element this is the second in and if you want to take out an element whatever went in first that will come out you can append another element but the next one will coming out will be this one so it uses fifo and in python you can use like a list or they have a library that can implement queues and basically that library is known as dq you can also use uh, a couple of stacks to implement queue that is a question that is sometimes asked and we will look at this question right now so suppose you want to implement a queue using two stacks you all you need to remember is restricting your addition appending at the at one end and taking out the element or popping the element at one end let's uh, look at the code for this so suppose you want to implement in a queue with a couple of stacks and the class that we have here so this class will basically have two stacks two stacks as shown here and then we can basically look at the nq and dq functionalities so the nq has like you want to basically append at the end and so whatever you do is you check the length of uh, length of s1 one of the stacks if it is not equal to zero you keep on append taking out the element at the from the end of s1 and keep on appending it in s2 so suppose you have s1 you keep on taking out the element and putting it in s2 now s2 is used as a temporary stack here because the our main stack is s1 and then you finally append when the s1 is empty you finally append this x element so it comes at the at one point it comes at the beginning and now you can only take out from the end so when you want to like after with this you will keep on adding all of the elements from s2 back into s1 so this will be the nq function and this will be the dq function so here we will first check if it is uh, empty or not if it is empty then we will simply print that the queue is empty and then we will get the last element which we want to take out and print return this last element so in the previous one in the previous slideshow i told you that uh, you have to restrict it i what I, what I said was you can append at the end and take out from the front you can do vice versa as well as shown here in this through this code you can append in the beginning and take out from it the important thing is that you can do one thing at one point only 
and this is the idea of queues and I will be giving a question about this so go ahead and practice that hey guys welcome to our session on hash maps and if you do not know already about these data structures then they may sound a little difficult but in actual they are not I will give you some easy examples of how to use them and they will seem pretty simple once you get the idea so hash maps are basically key value pairs so you will have a key and for each key you will have a particular value so suppose you have keys like one two three and then for each key you will have one or more than one value suppose for one i have my name here suppose for two we have my friend's name suppose for three we have another name all right these are commas so you can see that the one two three are simply keys and for each we have a single name akash john and amy okay and the hash map what it does is basically it makes use of a hash function this hash function is kind of inbuilt or you can make your own hash function but the main idea is that this hash hash function computes an index with a key into an array of these buckets or slots you know so this hash function will decide the key the index of this key and that's how this hash map achieves o1 of search lookup so suppose uh, you want to check if like three the key three exists in this map or not then this will it won't iterate through all of the keys the hash map will give o1 lookup based on this hash function so suppose i name this whole map as uh, m if i want to like i can access the key 3 m3 just like the address this will give me amy and if i want to like search if i have a condition i can search if 3 n m so this thing will run in o1 and i will know if the key 3 exists in this or not and yeah lookup time depends on the load and collision basically the number of entries or the total entries suppose um, for one key i have multiple names here i have like another character b and then another character c here so this will make the time more but overall searching for this key or searching for akash in this particular key this time will be less than in an array or a linked list and one thing that you should know is that these keys or these elements are not sorted in hash map so they can be like random and let me also show you how in python you can use hash map so suppose in python you can uh, like create a variable hash suppose we use dictionaries in python so suppose this is an empty hash map and if you want to like add a key so you will use like array and then you can either make a list list of names so name is the value and one is the key and if you want to append to this one value you can simply do append append class or anything else all right so i will discuss a question in the next video but for now these are the basics of hash map remember key value pairs and over lookup those are the major things and once you get the idea of it they become pretty easy so all right thank you for watching see you in the next one hey guys let's learn about binary trees today so binary trees are the trees which can have at most two nodes for each node so suppose this is the root node this root node can have one or two nodes at most and similarly would be true for each node following it so suppose this thing this thing is not a binary tree this would be become a graph but this as it all the nodes have at most two nodes this is a binary tree all right and the depth of a node suppose this is n the depth of this node um, is the number of nodes when you try to search this one from the root all right and this will be excluding n so the depth will be two here not three the depth will be two all right and the height of a binary tree is the maximum depth of any node in the tree so suppose right here we would have more nodes now the height of this binary tree will be one 
two and three all right that's the height the height will be the depth of the the node that is maximum all right and if you have a binary tree with height h then you can find the maximum number of nodes that, that it can have using this formula 2 to the power h plus 1 whole minus 1 this is the formula uh, we can erase this as i already showed you the power 2 to the power h plus 1 minus 1 so this is how if you know the height of a tree you can know how many nodes a tree can have maximum nodes right now let's discuss traversal of binary trees now there are three types of traversal one is pre-order in order and post order so let's see pre-order first pre-order is basically you have to display the root first then the left node and then the right node and this will be true for all the sub trees all right and for post order You will first display the left node, then the right node, and then the root node. And for in order, you will, as you can guess it already, you will first display left, then root, then the right node. I will also list this, and you can access this. And remember this because this is kind of important in learning the three kinds of traversal that a tree may have. Let's look at an example. So let's see a pre-order traversal. I will just show you how it can be done. Suppose we have one, two, three, four, five, and six. So if you are trying to pre-order traverse this one, you will first display the root. Let's see, I'll write all of them down. Pre, post, and in order. All right, so pre-order means that you will first visit root, then left, then right, then left, then right, then left, then right. All right, so the first is the root, which is one, then left, which is two. Then right, which is, then again, basically for each, this one also, you will again display the left. So again, like four, five, and then three, and then six. All right, and moving on, if you look at the post order, this will be left, then right, then the root. So the leftmost will be this one, because this will become the root of this. So left is four, then right, five, then root, two. And this was the left subtree, now coming to the right subtree. Again, the left, six, then right, there's no right, so back to root. And now left and right are done here. Left and right subtrees are done, back to root. So this is the post order traversal. Coming to the in order traversal, this will be root, left, and then right. So loop, so root, left, and then right, and then left, right, and then again left. So basically root, and then you come down to this left subtree. When you come down to this left subtree, you see that this is two is the root. So again, this two, then this right, because this is the root of this subtree, and so on and so forth. So these are the traversals. Let's look at uh, the pseudocode to understand better. So this is the simple pseudocode which is recursive. And in the pre-order, since you display the value, the root first, so that's why the you can display the root first, then you can recurse for left, then right. For in order, it is the left, then the root, then the right. So you first need to recurse for each left, then you can print the value of the root, then recurse for each right. So this will make sure that you get the left root and the right. All right. And this again becomes easy for the post order. You will recurse for left, then recurse for right, and then you can print the value. So these are the pseudocodes. These are recursive and you can implement them. It's good to know the implementations of these. All right. I hope you got everything and thank you for watching. See you in the next one. Hey guys. So let us discuss the two approaches that we have for binary trees. So we have top to bottom approach and the bottom to top approach. Bottom to top approach is more used, but let's discuss top to bottom approach first. So suppose you have a tree, something like this. 
and on top to bottom approach what we do is we store the result for each node and then we traverse down so we will do it for the root node first and then traverse down through the left node we will do it for this node and then traverse down and similarly for the right tree as well and after the whole tree is traversed the variable one variable will hold the result and that will be our answer so suppose you have to find the height of this tree we will start from the root the root's height is zero because it's the first point then we will traverse down to the left and we will add one to its height and similarly we will do it for the right one as well we will add one and so on we will keep on moving until the last node is reached and we will store our maximum height in a variable called maximum which will basically evaluate between the left and the right so the main idea is to solve for the credit node and then keep on moving down that's how the top to bottom approach works let's see the code for this one finding the height of the tree here as you can see we have a base condition which is like if you do not have a root we will return zero this is the base condition and then we will calculate for the left and the right nodes so we will calculate the left and right nodes through recursive we will call the height function and then add one as i explained earlier to the left node and similarly to the right node so we are calculating for each current node at first and then moving on and then as i said that we will return the maximum of left and right so this will be a top to bottom approach for finding the height of the binary tree. let's see how the bottom to top approach works so in a bottom to top approach what you do is you traverse from down to the top and for this you will basically solve for the left and the right subtrees and then move up and then find your answer so we solve for the problem for the left and right subtrees we then take the two results and solve it for the entire tree and as i said this result is more common than the top to bottom approach and suppose you have to find the height of the binary tree which we earlier did in the top to bottom one let's see how it works through bottom to top so what we'll do is we will first find the height of the lowest nodes and then keep on moving up so basically suppose for you are trying to find the height at this node you'll calculate the height of its left tree left subtree and the right subtree and get the maximum of it and then add one to it to get the height of this node and same same thing you'll do for the root node you calculate the height of the left subtree then the right subtree find the maximum and add one to it so that's how we move bottom to top let's take a look at its code so the code is like pretty simple for this one we just have a base condition here if not true then we just simply return zero that means the height is zero and then as i said we find the maximum of the root dot left the left subtree and the right subtree the maximum of it and then add one so that's how we traverse from bottom to top all right thank you so much for watching and i'll see you in the next one hey guys welcome back so we'll learn about binary search trees today so binary search tree is a binary tree where a given node n all of its nodes on the left subtree will have value less than the n node and all of the nodes in its right subtree will have values greater than n suppose we have something like three here then in a binary search tree only lesser values will be on the left and only greater values will be on the right so this will be true for each node so this is 2.5 and this is a valid binary tree but like suppose i have suppose if i would have five here then this would not be a valid binary search tree i will need to have value lesser than this number lesser than four but greater than three so i will need to have like 3.5 and probably five here so this is binary search tree all the nodes to the left of a node n will be less and all of the nodes to the right will be greater and this will be true for every node in the binary search tree and there can be duplicates and in that case we can decide whether the value is like on the left is equal or on the right is equal and this what we have right here is a balanced binary search tree and balanced binary search tree the height will always be log n 
all right and if you want to search any node then that will also be all right let me write this down here so like search addition and deletion all of these will be of login the reason being that you will know with each node if the next node that you're searching if it's lesser than your particular node then you'll go to the left and if the node that you're searching is greater than your particular node then you'll go to the right and this will reduce the complexity from o of n to o of log n right but if you have a non-balanced binary binary search tree so such as suppose you have like nodes something like this then in this case you will have to search all the nodes and then the complexity will be often this is usually not the case and we have balanced binary search trees in practice mostly all right and let us see an example suppose you have to give a tree and you have to validate if it is a binary search tree or not so suppose we have like three one five four six zero and two so you have to validate if this is a binary search tree or not so what you'll do is that when you start at the root node you'll have a minimum value which will be like negative infinity and a maximum value which will be infinity and then you will check if this root nodes value is in middle of these min and max because if it is not then it is not a binary source tree and when you when you traverse it down when you traverse to the left then your minimum node will remain this one will remain the minimum node that you already have min node is basically equal to the old min and the max node will be the particular root node so three in this case so if the value this value of this roots node the one is in is not in between min and max then it will be it will not be a binary search tree and similarly you will go down <coughs> sorry so suppose here your min value will remain the old min value which is negative infinity and the max value will become one and zero it is between those two values so it will be true in this case and when you pass from one to two then when you're passing to the right your maximum value rem will remain the old maximum so which is three in this case and your min value will become the roots value which is one in this case so if two is between one and three then it's right otherwise it would be false and similarly for this right subtree so your max value will remain the same which is infinity in this case and min value will become three and five is in between hey guys welcome back today let us look into the heaps data structure the heaps data structure are quite important as they are used in priority queue they help in sorting garbage collection and they basically make sorting or finding the largest number largest nth number a much faster process and we'll dive into these details later let's look at the two types of heap that we have so one is the max heap and the other one is the min heap so there are significant differences between both let me explain them in theory and then we'll look into the details so in a max heap the key present at the root node the one at the top that must be the greatest among all the keys that are below it so this in a max heap this root node will be the greatest and similarly this will be recursively true for all of the subtrees below it so suppose this is the greatest number among all then this node will hold the greatest value among this subtree 
this part and similarly this node will hold the greatest value among this subtree and so on and so forth all right and similarly for many it will be exactly vice versa this will the root node at the top will hold the minimum value of all of the other nodes and then this one just below it this will hold the minimum value among this subtree and similarly for this subtree the this node will hold the minimum value among this subtree so basically the node at the top the root node should be the minimum among all of the keys present in its children and similarly the all the properties should be true recursively for all the subtrees all right and let me show this let me show an example of maxi so that you get a better idea so maxi would be something like you have a digit a number 15 at the top then you have 13 maybe 11 then maybe 7 5 uh, i don't know 8 10 3 one and so on and so forth so basically as you see this node is the maximum among all of the keys below it then this node is maximum among all of the keys below it this node is maximum among all of the keys below it so this is a maxi and similarly for many i hope that you guys get the idea it is basically exactly the opposite the top most node should hold the minimum value then it can have more below it and this will be recursively true for all of the subtrees below it. All right. And Python provides us with a library which makes implementation of heap very simple. That is known as heapq library. So heapq uses the min heap concept. So you can use the heapq library, the module to implement heapq through the min heap. And basically where the parent is less than or equal to those of its children. So this is important. Parent less than equal to its children. All right. And there are some implementations in heap like insertion, deletion. All right. We'll look into those in the next video. And these implementations are good to know. You should always know them but they are not usually asked in the interviews you are, will never be asked to code these implementations you will just need to use these implementations in different questions and different concepts so thank you guys for joining and see you in the next one hey guys welcome back so let's discuss more about heaps today so one thing that I, that you should all know is that heaps are complete binary trees so when I say complete binary trees, it means that um, suppose you have a max heap like this. So this is a complete binary tree, which means that you have all of the levels completely filled except the last. So suppose um, so this is a complete binary tree, and all the levels are filled except the last this is also a complete binary tree this is a complete binary because all the levels are filled except the last but here this this won't be a complete binary tree because this the second last level is not filled in all right so this is not a complete binary while this here is a complete binary tree so you understand all the levels should be completely filled except the last that's called a complete binary tree and heaps are complete binary trees all right and more things about heaps is that in a max heap suppose in this one in a max heap you will if you want to find the maximum element you can just check out the top element so it provides o1 lookup of the max element in max heaps and similarly o1 lookup of minimum element in a mini and if you want to insert an element or delete element an element they both will take log of n times and this i will show you in a minute of how to basically insert or delete an element but as i said earlier these are not asked in interviews usually but these are something that you could know because the interview may 
just start discussing about these but you will never be asked to code these implementations all right so let's look at how to insert an element in heap suppose you have um, a max heap like this and then you want to insert an element too so basically what you do is uh, suppose you want to insert an element let's say not two this will be really easy you can just insert it at the end let's say you want to insert an element 11 so what you do is insert always insert at the end and then you propagate when i say propagate i mean that you check if the element that you inserted is greater than or lesser than its parent if it's greater than its parent, then you swap those nodes. So this 11 is greater than 10, so you swap them. So this becomes 10, this becomes 11, and this becomes 10. And you continue to do this as long as the parent is greater than its node. So right here we have 11 and 12, this satisfies the condition, but like suppose uh, you would have this as 10 again. Let me give a good example. Suppose you would have it like Suppose we had something like um, 9, and then 8 and 7 and you insert 11 so you swap these 8 comes here and 11 comes there so 11 comes here 8 comes here and then you continue to propagate because its parent is greater so now 11 will come here and 9 will come here so 9 and 11 and now you see that the parent is greater you do not swap you do not don't do anything and this helps you insert the element in log of n time all right and suppose you want to delete an element let's take another example something similar so suppose you want to delete the topmost element 17 or basically suppose you have like two here and you want to delete this two so while deleting what we do is we always delete the last element but we do not have to delete 2 we have to delete 17 so we first swap these elements 17 and 2 so right here at the top we will get 2 and this last element which was supposed to be 17 we deleted that now we have successfully deleted the element but this is not a max here right now because 2 is not the maximum element and it is at the root node so now what we do is something called heapify so in heapify we basically check the node its left element and its right element we check basically we find the maximum element among the three all right among the node left and right so whichever is the maximum element we swap those two we swap the node with that maximum element so here we have 16 as the maximum element we will swap 2 and 16 so this will become 2 and this will become 16 all right and we continue to do this as long as this node is like lesser than its lesser than its left and right nodes so we see that 2 is 2 is uh, 2 is lesser than its left and right nodes or like left and right node so we again find the maximum here which is 13 in, in this case we replace we basically swap the maximum element with the node so this becomes 2 and this would become 30. now this 2 is uh, the last element and it's basically there's nothing to compare in the left and right so here we satisfy our heapify condition and this is finally a max heap where we deleted one node all right so this would also take o of login time and i will be providing the implementations of both of these uh, basically all of these insert delete heapify and propagate i will basically provide the pseudo code so that you can look at it and understand at your convenience but you will never be asked to code them all right but it's good that you understand and can explain it confidently to your interviewer also one more thing i wanted to tell you guys is that heaps are mostly stored in the forms of arrays so suppose you have a heap here they can be stored and access through an array something like this so we have
All right, so we have like six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven digits here. So everything will be stored according to the level. So at the top, 17, then according to the level, then 16, then 14, then this level, 13, 12, seven, and six. Now the benefit of this is that whenever you have, you know the parent node, you know some node and you want to find its left node, the left child, left of any element x will be equal to two times x plus one always and right of x will be equal to two times x plus two and you can also find the parent of a particular node so that will be parent of x is equal to x minus one divided by two so let's look here take an example you have suppose you have 14 you want to find its left element so you see 14 right so it's at the in this 0 1 2 so 14 is at the in this 2 you want to find the left element so 2 into 2 4 plus 1 5 this left element will be 7 see it's 7 similarly for the right one 2 times 2 plus 2 will be 6 and similarly it's 6 here if you want to find the parent of say 14 only so that will be 2 minus 1 divided by 2 2 minus 1 equal to 1 divided by 2 and the fraction will be ignored so like 1 by 2 will equal to 0 0.5 and this will be ignored and become 0 so it will be at the 0 index which is 17 all right so that's a good way to know about the parents in the left or the right element and that's how we can basically use the heap if and the propagate function to insert and delete elements look at the pseudocodes of these and you will get a much better understanding and i will also be providing a question so that you can solve it and look at the solution of it all right thank you for joining and see you in the next one hey guys welcome back today we will learn about graphs so graphs are nothing but any combination of nodes and edges so suppose we have a node here which can have any number basically this is a node and this is like another node so any combination of nodes and the edges connecting them are known as graphs let's have like another node here so this can be a cyclic graph now this is an undirected graph so undirected graph has double sided edges basically so an edge from 1 to 2 in an undirected graph also means that there is an edge from 2 to 1 similarly there can be directed graphs so the directed graphs would look something like this there will be directed edges so this would mean that you have an edge from 1 to 2 2 to 3 and 1 to 3 not the other way around this would have an edge from 3 to 1 or 2 to 1 all right these are two types of graphs directed as shown in the example here and undetected the one i showed previously all right and we have clique so a clique is basically any graph where each node has has an edge to every other node in the graph so basically all the nodes are connected to all the other nodes through an edge that graph is known as click all right and graphs can be represented in memory in a couple of ways um like in coding or in memory basically graphs are represented either through adjacency matrix or adjacency list let's first take a look at the matrix adjacency matrix so in matrix suppose uh, you have like 0, 1, 2, 3, what I'm writing here are the nodes. So suppose 0, 1, 2, 3 are the nodes and they're also the indices of i and j. So 1 at, suppose it's something like, a 1 at 0 and 0 would mean that like a graph is, there's an edge from 0 to 0, which there always is because 0 is in itself a node connecting to itself. And then there is no edge between 0 and 1, there's no edge between 0 and 2, but there's an edge between 0 and 3. So here also 3 and 0, there's an edge. Now there are no edges between 2 and 0. There are no edges between 1 and 0. Suppose there's an edge between 2 and 1. And then 2 and 1 and 3, no edge. 3, no edge. And yeah, no edges here. So this would mean that um, if I draw this graph, this would be something like, okay, let me first draw 0, 1, 2, and 3. So we have an edge from 0 to 3 
and uh, design and director graph because they are mostly used in common interview questions and then you have an edge from one to two which means you have an edge from two to one and also you have an uh, yeah that's like your graph so they are as you can see there are two pieces of graph but this can be called a one graph let's look at uh, the other way of storing in memory which is through adjacency list so this is the most common method and if not specified in interviews assume this method adjacency list so this will be something like you have a node a this will point to a list of the nodes that it connects through edges like suppose a will connect to b and c and suppose b will connect to um, a and D. All right. If I draw this down, then this would be something like A, B, C, and D. So we have like A connecting to B and C. Suppose I'm drawing a directory graph, and B will be connected to A, and B will be connected to D. So this is the representation through adjacency list, and this is most common. Always remember this. Alright, these are the basics of the graphs and the graphs may seem a little difficult at the beginning, especially while coding, but as you get the idea of the implementation of DFS and BFS, basically depth first search and breadth first search, which we'll learn in the next videos, they will get much simpler and you'll get the hang of it. Alright, thank you for watching and see you in the next one. Hey guys, welcome to our session on graphs and today we will dive a little bit deeper and learn about the graph traversals which are DFS and BFS, basically depth first search and breadth first search. Let's see what depth first search is at first. So suppose you have a graph which has like nodes 1, 2, 3 and then another one 4. And then this might be connected as well. So this is an undirected graph, basically like all the nodes. So suppose you have one connecting to two, that also means that two will be connected to one. And depth first search basically means that you will search along the depth first. Suppose you start from any node, call it a root node. Suppose you start from one, you will search for two, and then you will search along the branch and you will go deeper. You will go to its depth. So you will search for three as well. And mark these as visited and when one, once you see that all of the nodes in this particular depth for your starting node one are already visited there's no more further then you will come back which is not the case here because like once you're going into depth you will also see that four also comes into depth suppose you had a different example so suppose you had an example of one two three and then um like four just like this right or like five as well so here you would be searching for depth for search like you will go to two market visited you go to three market visited and then there's no depth further so you will backtrack you'll see that both of these are visited you'll backtrack then you'll go to four and then you'll try to go deeper but then there's no node you'll mark four as visited backtrack to one and then come to five and then as soon as all the nodes are visited, you say that you have traversed the whole graph. So this is the idea of depth for search. Do not think of it as anything complex because I'll be showing you the code and explaining it. So let's look at the code here. This is a simple depth for search graph traversal. First, look at this function because this is the main function and this is the helper function. So look at it afterwards too. All right, so for the first one, you are given a graph, which is basically, as I said, if you are not told, it is an adjacency list. So, I'm sorry. So you have a set of visited where, we'll, where you will keep all the nodes that you have already visited. Then for each vertex in list of graph, so suppose you have like A visiting B comma C, then C visiting B comma D. So for each vertex, this is basically kind of a hash map you can see in Python. So for each vertex means uh, this A and C will be a vertex at the beginning. So for vertex in histogram, you'll go to A. You'll check if vertex not in visited. If A is not in visited, visited set. So suppose we have your visited set here. You will go to DFS helper with the vertex A and this vertex and this visited set. 
Now here you have V as A and visit it. Then you will add A node to visit it. You will basically print. So you will basically print A. And then for every neighbor in self graph V. So you are accessing a map at node V. So that means for B and C. So first B, then C. Now if neighbor not visited, if B not in visited, you will call this helper function again with the B node here. All right, you call it, you will add B to visit it set, you will print B. Then you will see for every neighbor in B. All right, so now suppose if you had like B here and it would have gone to D or something, then you will have checked if neighbor not in visited, if D not in visited, then you will call it for D because you are going depth for such A to B, then B to D. All right, then you'll add D here, you'll print D, and if there's nothing, then your function will simply backtrack. And then you will come to the like uh, the other node, which is C. You will add C here. You will print C. Then for each neighbor in C, you will see uh, like you will first get B, but B is already there and visited, and D is also there and visited. So nothing will happen. You'll backtrack. You'll come back, and then you'll see for another vertex, which will be C. Now C is already in visited, so nothing will happen. You'll come out of the function. So the basic idea is you have visited set you loop through each vertex and then inside each vertex you add it to visit it said you loop through each neighbor of the vertex these the neighbors and then keep on adding them into like keep on calling the function again and again so you're going depth for search all right this is the basic implementation try to practice this code and you learn it and once you see the this code in different questions you'll get a better idea of how to use it and you'll get happy to using it. All right, moving further, let's look at um, BFS. So BFS is much simpler to DFS. In BFS, suppose you have like this graph, one, two, three, and then four here. So BFS is breadth for search. You will basically visit the breadth first. So suppose you're starting from node one, then you'll visit two. Now you won't go to four as in depth for search, you will go to node 3 because you are trying to cover the breadth suppose you had like another node here 5 then you would have gone to 5 then you'll backtrack and then finally once you are on node 2 you'll visit its breadth which will be 4 so the traversal would be something like 1 2 3 5 and 4 suppose you had another node here like 6 then this would be coming in at the end all right this is the idea of breadth for search let's look at its code as well and in this code, as you can see, we will be using a queue because we want to travel in a bed breadth for search. All right. Again, we have a visited set, which is empty at the beginning. We have a queue, which has the first node. So suppose queue, we have a, we already added a, as this is the first node, we added a to our visited set. And then while there is something in queue, we will pop the first element. So you see pop zero means you're popping the first element. So you will get A and then basically print A. You visited A, you print A. And then for every neighbor of A in graph S, suppose your adjacency list was something like A, B, C, and then B, C, D. Now here the important thing is you will first visit A, all of the neighbors of A. So you will see you already visited A. Then for every neighbor in graph S, so that's B. If B not visited, you will append it and then add B to the visited. So B is there in your queue. This is popped out. Then you will pop B, you will print B. Then you'll see for every neighbor and so on. So basically what this will do is you'll print like A, B, then C, and then D. All right, this is the idea of bread for search. Let me know if you have any questions and as you solve more questions, you will get a better idea of these. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one. Hey guys, welcome back. So we will discuss the data structure try today and this data structure might be new for some of you. So we'll discuss the basics and I'll tell you how it is being implemented later in the next video. So a try is a data structure that can be used for dictionary like problems. It is somewhat like a tree having different nodes and each node will represent a letter. So suppose we have C here a here, R here, and 
S here and we can have like uh, D here right and like so for each word like we begin with C then we have A then we have R now car is a word and we will mark it as a word here so this will make car a word and then we will mark the node S also a word so this will show that cars is a word and then we have C A and we will mark T as a word which means the word cat is a word so you can see that you can find different words through the substrings and this helps quickly search the strings that start with the same substring so suppose uh, let's take a look at an example suppose our try contains these words right so our try contains car career caravan dog rat dogmatic so one of the four sub tree sub substring will be car and from car we can find career then we can find caravan so like it would be something like this c a r this is a word right and then we will have e e and then r career we can have like a car so this is a word this car is a word we can have s cars is a word we can have caravan so c a r then a then v then a and then n so this caravan is a word all right these are different ways of implementing a try and these can be used in dictionary like problems so suppose you want to implement an autocomplete like we are all have seen autocomplete in used in google search engines or bing search engines so suppose the user types the word car now through this try you have different words and you can suggest the words career cars and caravan this is something that can be done through try and it also can be done at a very fast pace because you already have a sub word and then you can build another word from it so the basic idea is that there is no restriction in the nodes you can have different nodes like there's no restriction you can have four five nodes and then there can be different nodes coming out of the sub nodes as well you just need to mark is word so wherever you mark is word that means that word is complete and this can carry on forward so if you mark is word here this whole path will be a word all right and as i said there's no restriction you can have different nodes it's not like a tree it's a bit similar to a tree in the concepts of node and the edges so uh, whenever we implement a try we use is word because we mark is word as true whenever you find a word and we also have children so we have so like for c we will have these three nodes as children and this can be used as a map we usually use it as a map and i will show and explain the implementation of the whole try data structure in the next video so Please do watch it before moving forward with the question that I will be giving. All right. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one. Hey guys, welcome back. So let's continue learning about the data structure try. And today we will see its implementation, which is very important because you can be directly asked to either implement try in any interview, or you can be given a dictionary like problems, which will be majorly solved by just implementing the try data structure. You just have to figure out that it's a it's asking for a try data structure all right so i will do and explain the code of try implementation in steps so here is the basic class that we create so as you can see we have a class node here which has a constructor function in it and we are basically creating a map of self.children and is word equal to false so this map self.children will basically store all of the children of a particular node so suppose you have a root node c and have different like a or t here then this cell of children for c will store a and t so basically storing all of the children there can be more so basically cell of children will store all of the children for a particular node all right and is word equal to false means that suppose at a the property is word is false that means that ca is not a word but then you have another node 
C A R and is word is true here. So is word is true here. We will mark is word equal to true whenever we know that this is a word. So this means that you have found a word in the subtree C A R, which is car. All right, and this is the class for try. So we will basically be have starting with a root node, taking the node class to make a node node for root. All right, this is very basic. Let's move on and let's see how we will insert. Now we are inserting. We have a loop as you can see here. We are provided with the word. Suppose we have to include a word car. Let's take the example car. So for each character in word, each W in word, we'll basically check if the W if it does not exist in the node dot children. So we have this map of children for like each node. And we start from the root node and we check if that W it does not exist. If it does not exist, then we create a W. So we will create a node for C and then point the node to the nodes children. So if it does not exist, we will basically create a new node. So C here and then point our node to C. And this will continue for each character of the word given. So now we will come to A. We will see that it does not exist in the particular nodes children in C's children. So we will add a new node and point to it. And similarly, the last one we'll do for R. And at the end, the most important part, we will mark node dot is word property equal to two. So this will be is word, which will sim simply signify that C A R car is a word. All right, let's move on and see how we will search for a node so suppose you are given a uh, search for a word so suppose you are given a try data structure something like c a r and s and t here all right and you have to search for a word c a r and this property is marked at is word true this property is also marked at is word true and this property is also marked at is word true all right you have to search for a word car you have to return if it exists or not true or false okay so here also we will check for each character in the word so w in word we will check if it does not exist in the children because suppose c if it does not exist then we will simply return false or if if in the next one suppose c exists and then a does not exist then we simply return false but if this condition is false which means we come to the next statement node equal to node dot children w which means we will mark our node we will point our node from c to a and then from a to r and this will run for the for all of the characters in word. So first C, it comes to node dot children, then it comes to A, then it comes to R. And our word has ended. We come out of the loop. We come to this line. Return node dot is word. So we will check if C R at R this node if is word is marked as true or false. If it is marked as true, then we will simply return true. If it is not marked as true, which is it is written it is marked as false. That means we will return false. All right, this is how the search runs in try. And now moving on to the last implementation is checking if there is a sub word. So suppose uh, like our previous example, you have cars and then you have uh, cat and then suppose CS, something like that. But like now only CAT is marked at is word and CARS is marked at is word not car is not marked as is word or suppose car is also marked as is word and we are given the prefix ca so we have to check if ca exists or not if there's a word that starts with ca or not all right now we will again like previous ones we will run this for loop w in prefix so for each character in prefix for c we will check if it does not exist because if c does not exist then we will simply return false this is very very similar to the search implementation and then we will move to the next node and then to the next node the only difference from search and starts with is the last statement we simply return true as soon as we come out of the loop we know that we have checked for c and then a which means we will come out of the loop and we will return true which means the prefix exists as you must have seen in the search we had to return only when the is word criteria is true but here we do not check for it because we are only checking for the prefix so ca means it is true all right that is the major difference between starts with and search and i hope you got to understand a little bit about the try implementation i will be compiling the code and giving it to you as a solution so you can practice it and get a better understanding of it please let me know if you have any questions thank you for watching everyone